I'm Chanya, and I know I'm not the only one who has fallen in love with the dazzling world of Bridgerton. But what's the real history of 1813, the year this sumptuous Netflix series was set? Reigning at the time was King George III and his wife, Queen Charlotte of mecklenburg strelitz By 1813, King George III's mental illness had become so acute that a regency had already been established, giving the regency period of 1811 to 1820 its name. Between these years, Queen Charlotte and King George III's son, also George, Prince of Wales, ruled as Prince Regent. He was later known as King George IV. The regency period is epitomised by the Prince Regent himself. In his youth, he was flamboyant, fashionable, handsome, and the freedom and extravagance of his regency contrasted with the stricter, more rigorous early reign of his father. Though the Regency Bill of 1789 declared that the prince should act as regent should the king become permanently insane, it also put the king, his court, and his minor children under the guardianship of Queen Charlotte. So who was Queen Charlotte? Born in 1744, Queen Charlotte was the youngest daughter of a family who ruled over mecklenburg strelitz a small North German duchy. Sent to England at the age of 17, Queen Charlotte married King George III only six hours after she first met him. By all accounts, the union was largely happy and produced 15 children, 13 of whom lived into adulthood. Though Bridgerton's varied racial representation is a refreshing reimagining of London's high society at the time, some historians do actually argue that Queen Charlotte, brilliantly portrayed by Golda Rouchevelle, may have had mixed racial heritage, potentially tracing her lineage back to King Alfonso III of Portugal and his African mistress, Magdragana. These claims have been based on contemporary accounts of Queen Charlotte's appearance. Just as in Bridgerton, Queen Charlotte remains a fascinating figure in many respects. She was a significant patron of the arts who loved going to concerts and is known to have helped nurture the career of a young Mozart who performed for her aged just eight. You might be wondering what it is Queen Charlotte is sniffing. In the 19th century, Snorting snuff, or dried tobacco, was incredibly popular, as smoking was seen as inelegant. Throughout the series, Queen Charlotte appears to revel in the salacious society scandals, orchestrating matches at her whim. In reality, by 1813, with the stress of King George III's mental illness, Queen Charlotte had become increasingly isolated and depressed. In November 1818, she died, ending her reign as the second longest serving consort in British history a role she held for 57 years and 70 days. The longest serving consort is, of course, Prince Philip. Bridgerton capitalises on Regency London's insatiable desire for gossip. While Lady Whistledown is a work of Bridgerton fiction, gossip consumption at the time was rabid. The invention of the steam press in 1811 and its adoption by top London newspapers and magazines in 1814 meant that the dissemination of information occurred up to 10 times faster and much more cheaply than before. Town and Country magazine documented the scandals of London's elite with a gossip column called Tete a Tete. The unfortunate objects of every article were mysteriously alluded to. For example, Miss C, the pious preacher, the military man. These columns could be merciless. In 1779, when a duke called Lord Percy sued his wife for adultery, the Town & Country magazine alleged he was impotent due to his excessive masturbation and habitual brothel visiting as a schoolboy. He went on to have nine children with his next wife, in case you were wondering. The opening scene of Bridgerton shows the fine ladies of London preparing for their first debut into the London social season. The very ball depicted did actually take place. It was founded in 1780 by King George III in honour of Queen Charlotte's birthday, and so the tradition of being formally introduced into society by presentation to the monarch at royal court began. Believe it or not, this tradition lasted until 1958, when our current Queen Elizabeth ended it. Prince Philip referred to it as bloody daft. The London social season was developed to coincide with the sitting of Parliament, as the members of the House of Lords and House of Commons moved into London from the country with their families, the sudden influx of upper-class people needed to be entertained. The season began in late October and lasted until summer recess of Parliament in June and July. It was not uncommon to attend two balls a week during the season. This was seen as an opportunity to secure advantageous marriages, cement your social standing, buy and sell property and form allegiances. Dancing, as we see in Bridgerton, was a very important part of this process. It was a chance for a lady to display her elegance and to meet and converse with potential suitors. As in Bridgerton, private balls were organised by a hostess 
who chose the venue, usually her own house, and the guest list. Invitations could be sent as far as six weeks in advance, or as soon as 10 days. Typically, a ball began around 9 or 10 p.m. and lasted until 5 a.m. the next morning. It sometimes ended with breakfast. Let's talk about jewels. When Anthony believes Simon has besmirched Daphne's honor, he challenges him to a duel. We will settle this as gentlemen. He knows that it's illegal, and that if he killed Simon, he'd have to flee the country and the law. But just how common were jewels in 1813? During the reign of King George III, there were 172 recorded jewels, and very likely many more kept secret, which resulted in 69 recorded fatalities. Jewels were often referred to as affairs of the honour because a gentleman ought to remove the stain which he conceives attaches to his honour. One of the prime locations for illicit jewels in London was Hyde Park, which was commonly known to be less than safe at night. We see a lot of boxing in Bridgerton, and historically this was a popular pastime. Prince George, later George IV, was a known lover of the sport. In 1812, with boxing's popularity at an all-time high, journalist Piers Egan even went as far as to claim that boxing defined British identity. We even take some of our idioms from this period. Phrases such as start from scratch or not up to the mark may refer to the line in the sand that was drawn to divide the ring. Simon's friend and boxer, Will Mondrich, portrayed by Martin Zimhungby, is another character from the Bridgerton world based on a real person, a boxer called Bill Richmond. Born into slavery in 1763 in Staten Island, New York, Richmond left for England when he was just 14 and grew to great prominence during the Regency era for his fighting skills. Finally, I couldn't talk about Bridgerton without mentioning the sheer glamour of the costumes. The beautiful Bridgerton dresses largely resemble long, flowing styles and silhouettes reminiscent of the Regency era. Though the brash colours and use of crystals and glitter show how modern techniques and modern fabrics have been interwoven with Regency-inspired styles to create something altogether new and mesmerising. Bridgerton creates a beautiful, stylized world. Not historically accurate, but fully enjoyable nonetheless, especially at a time when we could all do with a bit of an escape. Thank you so much for watching and see you soon for more historical content.